I'm looking forward to the next one. Great. Okay. Thanks, John. I really thank Cambridge Grove Housing for letting us use this space. It's so comfortable and really inviting. It's perfect for a talk like this. Um, I'm Rick Charnas. I live in Newton. Um, and I um, have been involved in various ways with Tikkun Magazine and its arm uh, network of spiritual progressives um, for a couple of decades. And um, I resonate very deeply with its message um, of creating a caring society. Um, and um, Tikkun combines attention to psychology and emotional life with a desire to change the world and change the institutions of the world as well as ourselves, as well as having spirituality be a deep part of this whole process. And um, um, uh, we used to have a, uh, a chapter of, of Tikkun some years ago, 15 years ago, and possibly with this event, we might resuscitate the chapter, which made a, a big difference in the lives of, of many of us here. Um, Peter is an editor um, of, of the magazine, and um, we are just getting to know each other um, over the last two years, actually. I used to live in the Bay Area, and I, Peter lives in San Francisco, and we think I was at his house some 25 years ago <laughs> uh, when I was involved with Tikkun in San Francisco. And, um, and I lived in a commune. Uh, yeah. Um, and um, uh, Peter um, started an alternative school in San Francisco called New College. Uh, near where I, I used to live in the Mission District and uh, taught law there and was president of the law school there for 20 years. Um, he's involved in the uh, critical legal studies movement, which is a movement within the law to have a different framework other than the adversarial framework. Um, and um, when I heard that Peter had written this book, I uh, was very excited. I read Peter's work, uh, which has been published in Tikkun uh, for, for many years, various essays in, in the magazine. I've always been incredibly moved by Peter's sensitivity to the flow of social energy and uh, emotional energy and political energy as it flows and rotates, revolves around all of us uh, from person to person and into the institutions. Um, and I've always been very drawn to that particular um, elucidation of, of where we are. Um, and um, Peter graciously gave me a copy of the book to read, which is, I am just so impressed by the book and so moved by it. I feel like it lays out um, a view of human life that many of us have not seen before, really, have not heard articulated. Um, it, as, you, as I read this book, I had a lot of moments where I realized that some of the ideas in there had been forming in me in incipient form, but had never really been uh, come to consciousness. And um, uh, Peter is here in Boston, um, or his uh, partner is in town. Uh, she's a union organizer. Um, local the national union unite here, unite here. Hotel and, cool. and um, Peter has um, spoken about this book in a number of other cities but not yet in Boston and we wanted to make this happen here um, 
please take some of the flyers that uh, describe Tikkun Magazine and Network for Spiritual Progressives. These flyers are from a number of years ago, uh, but they give you a sense of what Tikkun is and Network for Spiritual Progressives. Please sign this um, form here with your name and email if you'd like to stay in touch. So I'm very happy to have this evening and uh, I think it'll be a wonderful listen to some really beautiful, deep ideas. So, Peter Gable, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Great. So, uh, looking through cataracts, apparently, I've just learned. So, I'm just making that point in case it affects me. I'm peering out at you this way. Um, <laughs> So, um, so many, many people approach society, uh, the world, thinking about the world, talking about the economy, the legal system, the system, uh, even society, as if, as if society or the system or the economy or the legal system were an entity that you could look at from the outside and kind of describe, either liking it or not liking it. <clears throat> but there's a paradox there because we exist from the inside. We live the world. We are not kind of units in a world seen from the outside. So my interest in this book has been to try to describe as best I could, the world from the inside, as we actually live it, rather than from the outside. I, I think I, I probably never use, except in a, in a sort of flip way, the system or society, but rather try and describe the field of existence, the field that we live in. And of course, it's, it's a description coming from me. So it's, it's, completely biased, you might say, except that I think that we are all universal beings, we are common human beings, and therefore if we can understand our own experience of the world and be true to it and transmit it or illuminate it, that we can actually approach describing reality as it is. And uh, so the, so drawing from myself, I assert, let's say, I, I say that all human beings are animated by a desire for mutual recognition, a desire to see and be seen by one another as we really are in our, in our whole presence to each other. And uh, uh, that desire, in, in a way, was described by Martin Buber, the Jewish theologian, as a <coughs> The experience of I and thou, aspiring to an experience of my experiencing you as a thou. But in a way, it's, that is a very two-person image, and I, I would really try to, I would describe it more as longing to enter into each other's presence in an experience of being here, rather than uh, being detached, aloof, and peering out of the world from a distance. Um, <clears throat> newborn children remind us of this every time they arrive uh, because newborn children are fully present. Uh, they, one of the reasons they create such joy in us is that they immediately pull us out of our own detachment, our learned detachment, into uh, the, the immediacy of connection with them. And they kind of give us a window into the, the desire, the expectation of what I'm calling mutual recognition in this book, the desire to see and be seen as we really are. And of course, it's, it's, they're great, but it's also great for us to be pulled out of our own, our own remoteness or distance. So I say that longing exists in all of us. And welcome. But unfortunately, 
which we live in a world in which that desire for mutual recognition. Do we need to find more chairs? There's a few more seats. And there's so one more. here. There's a thin person. We got a great face <laughs> for Okay, you okay? Thank you. Sorry. No, it's okay. So, un unfortunately, whatever to say about it, we exist in a world in which the desire, this desire, the desire for mutual recognition, is everywhere denied. We live in a, in a milieu of the denial of desire for mutual recognition, and uh, how can we? How can I capture this? We pass each other with blank gazes on the street. We're, without realizing it deeply, withdrawn into ourselves, peering out at others who go past us. But the actual, actual contact between us and the person passing us is, is glancing. Uh, and actually, there's a section in the book on street life, um, on the aversive presence of street life. Uh, and if I can remember to come back to this, it's not always so that the streets are characterized by that. There are periods in rising social movements when the streets burst out in an experience of community and people recognize one another. Um, and in a way, the book tries to capture the difference between those two existential realities. Coming back to the first one, then, the, the longing for mutual recognition and the fact that everywhere uh, our longing seems blocked. The desire for mutual recognition seems to be denied by others whom we encounter. And we internalize in ourselves from our earliest years the way we are, are seen. Because we are all social beings, we're not really individuals. We immediately, as soon as we come into the world, we seek the connection with the other, recognition of the other, and we must become the way that we are recognized by the other, because that completes our social, um, our, our being brought into the world as social beings. And uh, uh, I was preoccupied in my younger years by the, the thing I'm describing, the, the fact that people are, seem so detached from each other and to speak to each other across a great distance. That was my experience of life. Um, you know, I, w I went to law school, Harvard Law School here, and uh, people arguing, making this point and that point with glazed eyes, and it seems to me that you could argue that the piece of paper was entirely worthless because there was no consideration for some piece of the stuff. And the, the, the actual person uh, was not really present. There was a role being performed by the people around me that was being enacted and uh, practiced, actually, taught by the person making the performance in the front of the room and then enacted by each new generation, it seemed to me. And uh, so, and actually, right at that time when I was in law school, I watched the evening news regularly in Boston and on would come a uh, man, some of you may recognize him in this city, I don't know, uh, but I don't, I, I don't actually want to name him, I'm sure he's perfectly nice human being, but he, he would say, the Red Sox win and a fire in Dorchester, back in a moment, <laughs> with his gestures ever so slightly delayed, and his eyes having that glassy, glassy-eyed stare that I'm trying to describe, and uh, it was clear to me that he was not there, that he was performing himself for some reason but that he himself was deeply withdrawn within and had cast up a mask that was separating himself from me, watching, actually pushed me back into the couch, uh, you know, by his performed persona that I subsequently realized as I thought about it that was not accessible to being really seen because he was also implicitly claiming that this is who I really am. In other words, there was a meta dimension to the performance, which was, 
I'm real here. I'm, I'm really here. I am this newscaster. When actually he wasn't really there. You see what I mean? So of course he couldn't. The whole point was for that to be inaccessible to the other, to deny that he was being artificial or false, and to, to conceal something deep within himself. And so, uh, so here I am in the law school, and then I'm watching the evening news. Uh, did any of you see the movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers <laughs> from your youth? I mean, uh, okay, so uh, that's how I felt during that period. I felt like I was, I was surrounded by that kind of uh, artificial culture pretending to be real and denying that it was unreal. So, So I, I but uh, it, it, seemed, it seemed clear to me that the newscaster, although he was a very striking example of, of what I'm talking about, oh, and I want to say something else about him. What was he, why was he doing this? What was he trying to guard himself against? He, he was guarding himself against actually being seen, actually being seen as a really present human being. Uh, so the mask that denied that it was false was blocking, was, was sealing off his true being within. His conditioned self was being performed. His true being was deeply, deeply withdrawn inside. And his fear, his fear of the other in that performative behavior was a, a, an inner fear of humiliation. That Humiliation seemed to be the key, that if he revealed who he was and all his vulnerability and presence, he would be not be re recognized. It would not be reciprocated. It would not be, he would not be loved for who he actually was or embraced for who he was. So a life inside that is, is a, a difficult life where one is constantly managing one's outer self that's being performed without you fully knowing that you're doing that, hardly knowing it really, and denying to the other that it's so. Uh, it's kind of navigating through a world of social separation. And of course, it's not just the newscaster. It's, this is what I came to realize. It's, it's all of us who are conditioned in a world of social separation, who become a self through our conditioning that is not an, a manifestation of our true being, and so we're, we're carrying a kind of double self, uh, double life, you might say. The longing for mutual recognition, always animating us in every encounter with others, yet the conditioned self keeping us always separated from others and unconscious of the fact that we are doing so. Uh, as a way of trying to capture how it's in all of us, uh, there's a coffee shop in my neighborhood, Martha's Coffee Shop in Noe Valley. It has a giant mirror on the wall where you get the coffee. And I have noticed that every single person who comes in to get coffee checks themselves out in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> and the person they're checking out in the mirror is not their, it's, it's, it's an outer self that, that they are carrying. Like he's, he looks good. He looks not that good. Uncool. Cool. Okay. Hair right. This is all a this is all a a double a doubling of the self in which there's an outer self that one is carrying, managing, preoccupied with, thinking about, rehearsing for the next moment, reliving a past moment where you might have been revealed for something you didn't want to be revealed for, and therefore you relive it to try to overcome the, the feeling of, of pain and humiliation associated with whatever mistake may have been made. Uh, this, is, this is the dilemma of ourselves, our conditioned selves in a world characterized by predominantly, but not exclusively, but predominantly by social separation by people at a distance. Uh, when, when you are, when we are, carrying our outer selves through the world, 
the selves of our conditioning from our earliest life as the prior generation passes on to us the limitations of prior generations as we are brought into the world. When you are carrying that outer self, you know, you, you know that, it's, that something is lacking inside your soul. The fullness of presence, of your presence with others is not being realized. And so um, in the book I describe the, the desire to be the perfect other. What I mean by that is the constant effort to inflate the outer self to some image that you think you are not in order to finally satisfy the other who conditioned you originally, in order to try and finally become whatever is missing in the self that you've been conditioned to have. So the desire to become the perfect other becomes a preoccupation that can't possibly be successful. The reason it's desire to become a perfect other is, is that the lacking image of the self that we have internalized seeks to inflate itself because it's missing something and become perfect that it can't possibly become because it's not actually real. It's not, it's the outer self or the false self as I describe it, that all of us carry as part of who we are in the world. So, uh, so in our alienated conditioning, and I, I want to say actually, also the world is beautiful, encounters with others are potentially joyful, and the longing for mutual recognition that exists at all times always is manifested in every moment also. It's somewhat subordinated in an alienated world to this spiritual imprisonment of the self, but uh, it's always trying to get out, and so there's always hope. <laughs> there's always hope in the worst of times. It's my conviction, my optimism, that you know, neither Donald Trump nor rain nor sleet nor hail is going, to, <laughs> is going to stop the upward movement of the evolution of human consciousness as we seek to become aware of the things that I'm saying, I believe, and create, actually intentionally create a world in which we can overcome the legacy of humiliation that's inside us and the legacy of fear of the other that has, that has conditioned us and shaped us up to this point. So we have our being, we have the self, and then there's the moat that I talked about, the moat. The moat is the existential space that separates us from others, and uh, getting over the moat is, is a longing in all of our hearts, and it ha actually in the section in the book on social movements that I'll come to in a moment, there are periods in history when we actually get over the moat and there's a ricochet of presence in the world that transforms the world when it occurs. But before I get to that, let me describe a bit of the social pathologies that come from the legacy of separation. And that is, in the self I was describing this uh, effort to become the perfect other, the outer, to inflate the outer self is always being deflated, I'm trying to pump it up again. When one what really wants, when what, when what one really wants is to be in the present with another, here, to be seen that would heal that entire internal, intrapsychic, <clears throat> mental preoccupation with the image of the self that is lacking. And, uh, so, okay, so there's our being, there's the self that we're conditioned to be, and there's the moat. Um, what happens to the longing to be connected to others, then? What happens to it in our separation? Well, we come to identify with imaginary communities, and people, people, people uh, aspire, of course, to be in community. So people come to identify with imaginary communities that are a substitute for the real thing, in which people don't actually experience one another as I and thou in relation to each other, but share a common hallucination or 
imagined oneness with others that is actually dangerous, pathological, a tremendous problem. And we have this now with uh, Trump, Donald Trump and make America great again. The idea of make America great again. The idea there is that there is a false we, an outer we, that of course is lacking because it doesn't have the anchorage of true being to it. It's a hallucinated projection, in this case, America. And, uh, and because of its lacking nature, like the self, there's a constant need to inflate the imaginary <coughs> community that is always in danger of collapse. Thus, make America great again is just made up out of people's suffering, out of their feeling of isolation, disconnection, and humiliation, inner humiliation for not being seen, drawn out, in this case, by, by someone who was, also has this problem, <laughs> and, and then is constantly trying to inflate itself for fear that it will deflate. So Make America Great Again is, 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 a, is the, in a way, it's perfect as, as the image of what I'm talking about. It's a lacking imaginary image that feels its own lack that's trying to inflate itself. And uh, you can see this also in this, in the, in this uh, it has to be, it's like this, it has to be perfect, the imaginary community, so you can't take a knee at the football game. See, that's why Colin Kaepernick is forbidden from taking a knee, is that if he takes a knee, it threatens this imaginary unity that everyone inwardly knows isn't real. And that imaginary community is protecting, is compensating for people's isolation and solitude and withdrawnness. And it's protecting them from having their own true humiliation and longing for connection to others, have to have that actually be seen. So it's a, it's a compulsive thing. It's a compulsory thing to keep America great again. And so if you take a knee, that hearkens to its potential deflation, mm -hmm. the deflation of the false we. And again, the loss here is not the loss of the image of the false we of America. The loss is that if this doesn't hold my real longing to be loved, to be seen, to exist in real relation to the person next to me, my children, my wife, my husband, my, to my co-workers, to really be seen by others, that longing will become visible if, if the defense doesn't hold. So, uh, so this is, uh, so people will, will kill people for this. People will go to war over this image, over the maintenance of the image. Um, McNamara acknowledged that avoiding humiliation, sometimes it enters into regular consciousness, that avoiding humiliation was the reason for the extension of the Vietnam War mm. for uh, seven or eight years. Uh, and, you know, 30, 40 thousand Americans and hundreds of thousands of Asians were killed to prevent that humiliation. But we know that Trump in North Korea fairly recently, he, he would go, to, he would have a nuclear war to protect the collective hallucinated image of greatness. He, so millions, tens of millions of people would be killed in order to keep this in place. So this is a small thing. This is a hugely significant collective pathology, the, the role of the imaginary community. Uh, if you were shocked by the separation of children from their parents at the border, I think, well, why, what, how could they do this, really, knowing the trauma that a young infant would suffer being bureaucratically taken away from his or her parents, it's just almost inconceivable. But, but Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions are afraid of the person next to them, is 
what I'm saying. They're afraid of this person and this person and that person. And they have been living in that fear all their lives. Although they've been part of the Ku Klux Klan and Jeff Sessions, they've been part of groups. They've been part of the performed conditioning of the male gender in Donald Trump's case. You know, he's a pretty muscular military, uh, he was military school <coughs> student. But actually, he's been living in, a, in a, an experience of, of isolation and fear <coughs> his entire life. So for him, he is not, he's afraid of the person next to him. Jeff Sessions. It might be Jeff Sessions, yeah. But I mean, also might be his wife and children. I'm sure it is, of course it is. And of course, he has a relationship with them as the father and Donald Trump and the business thing and all of, and even residually as a human being. In a residual way, he's not, for the most part, completely psychotic, meaning totally cut off from reality. Although if he would kill tens of millions of people to protect the image of America, that's that's worth describing in some ways as psychotic, isn't it? I mean, come on. It's just, it's horrifying. The North Korea situation, for example, there was nothing at stake. Well, maybe their missiles were dangerous. I'm not saying that. They're into this. They had the same problem I'm describing. But Anyway, it was, it, was a, it was a scary moment when he gave the UN speech about fire and fury or whatever it was. It was, it was a scary moment, for sure. But this might get out of hand, this entire collective uh, imaginary. So here's another example. Why are racists racists? Why is white racism present in our world? What is its meaning? I, I'm saying, I would say, white racism is, all racism, but I'm talking about this, but white racism here, is it's that an inner absence, an inner absence of fear of humiliation, of fear of actually being seen by the other who won't reciprocate the longness in your heart, leads you to become attached to an outer identity that's, in this case, a purely arbitrary feature of the color of your skin. I mean, we're sort of white, what color, pinkish white. But I mean, identification with this collective feature that then is imagined to be under threat from non-white, from people of the non-white color, who are constructed in order to fantasize your own racial creation. By racial, I mean here, literally, in this case, I'm talking about the feature of being white. So the inflation of that to a level of superiority and a demonization of the other who is imagined to lack that and be threatening to that is what I'm talking about as the construction of an imaginary unity that's compensating for an inner feeling of emptiness and lack of being seen. 